and day. There's a meeting for that immediately after church tonight. Is that correct? Dad will meet with you right after church right here. Uh, but the kids will now sing uh, that second song that we'll do as uh, I'll uh, lead that from the piano there. And if you feel if you've gotten familiar with it, feel free to sing along with us. I think most of the kids are learning this one, and some of them know it pretty good. Uh, the chorus is pretty simple. Who is like the Lord our God, strong to save, faithful in love? My debt is paid and the victory won. The Lord is my salvation. Especially when we get to the chorus, feel free to sing along with us. And um, really listen, the words to the verses of this is... Uh, really quite powerful.
Amen. This morning, during our, uh, for years in, on the first Sunday of the month, we would take the Sunday school hour and work with our youth, and so we did that this morning again, and we ran over that song, and I, I stopped them and asked them, what did salvation mean? You know, and I put the kids on the spot, and, and they gave good answers, uh, but generally it was, uh, means you've been saved. Salvation is what you get when you get saved. And I asked him a question and, and shared a little bit of, of my mom's testimony. Mom told me once that the first time dad asked her if she was a Christian, she said, well, of course, I've always believed in God. And dad said, well, good, when did you get saved? And she said, saved from what? She just hadn't grown up in a, in a Bible-preaching church and... Uh, and it's a good question. You know, if you ask somebody if they're a Christian, a lot of times they'll say yes. But what does it mean to be saved? What does it mean to have received salvation? And the Lord is our salvation. If you don't have the Lord, you don't have salvation. Amen? It's not a program. Uh, it's a person, the person of the Lord Jesus and getting to know Him. And, and I would challenge you to pray. I know you get to see and hear those kids and the youth. But pray for them because... Uh, I believe that to know God and to walk with Him in this day and age is harder than ever. I think there's just so much. Uh, the devil is a master tactician, and he has uh, taken many of our young people just through distraction um, or uh, temptation, rebellion, whatever the case may be. It's not easy to walk with Jesus during this day and age. And so uh, I challenge you to pray for our young people and uh, how many of you were here last Sunday night? Last Sunday night, um, after Justin came up with that donkey um, icon for my message title um, on Sunday morning, he was putting this uh, announcement, tonight's message, the Donkey King. Some of the kids were a little disappointed that all I did was preach about Saul. But if you were here, we introduced you to the first as far as anointed king of Israel, Saul. And we talked about the fact that Saul was exactly what the people wanted. The people demanded a king. They did not want God ruling over them. And instead of waiting, I believe it was always God's plan to give them a king, uh, a king from the tribe of Judah that would be a man after God's own heart. We see that in David. But they were not requesting a king because they were wanting to be in line with God's will. They were rejecting God as king. And therefore, they wanted, um, they wanted a man to be over them. They wanted a big, stout leader, and that's what God gave them. And we looked at that last week. And really, unfortunately, Saul is almost, in some ways, a victim of circumstance. The people demanded a king. Uh, God took this young man that was bigger than everybody in Israel... And, and by the way, David, if you look at a contrast, David was the smallest of his brethren, yet he put his life on the line for his daddy's sheep. Saul was out looking for the donkeys, and he wasn't even doing that great of a job, and he gave up before he knew they were found. Uh, and so it's kind of an interesting contrast. But tonight, I want to pick up uh, again on Saul, and th there's no doubt we will see Saul as we look at some of the... Uh, key events in the life of David uh, down the road, but Saul is an interesting study because he goes down as a man who had a bright start. When he begins, it appears that even from God's perspective, he had a promising future, and, and it falls apart. You have a young man who is humble, who has got a lot of grace. When people uh, criticized and came against Saul, and Saul could have, after his first victory, stuck it to him, he did not do that. He had actually been, the Bible says, the Spirit of the Lord had come upon him. He had prophesied, and he had become friends with Samuel. I believe Samuel was heartbroken uh, over the course of Saul's career because of his affection for Saul. But how do you go from a good start there, becoming friends with Samuel, being anointed the king of God's people, into 
the end of Saul. At the end of Saul's life, we see Saul, by the way, repeatedly attempting to kill David. You see him throwing a javelin at him in chapter 19. In chapter 20, he throws a javelin at his own son, Jonathan. I mean, he's actually attempting murder on his own son. In, in 1 Samuel 22, Saul orders the murder of the priests of God at the town of Nob. Some 80 priests killed, murdered at Saul's hand. And at the end there, at chapter 28, Saul consults with a witch at Endor and ultimately commits suicide. That was a terrible end of a promising life. But what were the steps that got him there? The beginning of the end is recorded for us in 1 Samuel 13, and that's where we'll be tonight for our text. Why would anybody choose to act foolishly and disobey God and then get the consequences of that? I don't believe most people set out to leave a lousy legacy. Amen? I don't believe most people set out to leave a lousy legacy, but that was the case with Samuel. I believe there's some application for us tonight as New Testament believers, even as we look at this Old Testament story. So if you would stand with me, 1 Samuel 13 will be where we start. And just so we kind of see the whole picture, I'll start at verse 1. I'll read about 14 verses here. It says, Saul reigned one year, and when he had reigned two years over Israel, Saul chose him 3,000 men of Israel, whereof 2,000 were with Saul in Michmash in the mount. That's a really cool name for a place, Mishmash. Anyhow, whereof 2,000 were with Saul in Michmash in the Mount Bethel, and 1,000 were with Jonathan in Gibeah of Benjamin. And the rest of the people he sent every man to his tent. And Jonathan smote the garrison of the Philistines that was in Geba, and the Philistines heard of it. And Saul blew the trumpet throughout all the land, saying, Let the Hebrews hear. And all Israel heard say that Saul had smitten a garrison of the Philistines, and that Israel also was had an abomination with the Philistines. And the people were called together after Saul to Gilgal. And the Philistines gathered themselves together to fight with Israel, 30,000 chariots and 6,000 horsemen and people as the sand which is on the seashore in multitude. And they came up and pitched in Michmash eastward from beth Aven, when the men of Israel saw that they were in a strait, for the people were distressed. Then the people did hide themselves in caves and in thickets and in rocks and in high places and in pits. And some of the Hebrews went over Jordan to the land of Gad and Gilead. As for Saul, he was yet in Gilgal, and all the people followed him trembling. And he tarried seven days according to the set time that Samuel had appointed. But Samuel came not to Gilgal, and the people were scattered from him. And Saul said, Bring hither a burnt offering to me, and peace offerings. And he offered the burnt offering. And it came to pass that as soon as he had made an end of offering the burnt offering, behold, Samuel came. And Saul went out to meet him, and he might, that he might salute him. And Samuel said, What hast thou done? And Saul said, Because I saw that the people were scattered from me, and that thou camest not within the days appointed, and that the Philistines gathered themselves together at Michmash, therefore said I, The Philistines will come down now upon me to Gilgal, and I have not made supplication unto the Lord. I forced myself, therefore, and offered a burnt offering. And Samuel said to Saul, Thou hast done foolishly. Thou hast not kept the commandment of the Lord thy God, which he commanded thee. For now would the Lord have established thy kingdom upon Israel forever, but now thy kingdom shall not continue. The Lord hath sought him a man after his own heart, and the Lord hath commanded him to be captain over his people, because thou hast not kept that which the Lord commanded thee. This is the beginning of Saul's end, the fall of Saul, and we'll get into that tonight. Lord, we love you and praise you, and God, we thank you for your word. I thank you, God, that, uh, Lord, we get to see uh, how you uh, acted in the past, and Lord, the, we get to see the way people, um, Lord, uh, obeyed and was were able to reap the benefit of that, and then also, Lord, as tonight, we get to see where people disobeyed and, and reaped the consequence. God, I pray that you'd help us be with my brothers and sisters in Christ tonight. I pray that we would be encouraged and edified tonight, built up by your word, and that we would each be better equipped for the work of the ministry that we've been given. God, it is my prayer that 
the Lord, if someone here has never been saved, that your Holy Spirit would do a work in their heart. They would come to a place of trusting uh, in Christ tonight is my prayer. And above all, we ask that you be exalted, lifted up, and glorified. We thank you and praise you, and we give you this time in Jesus' name. Amen. You can be seated. Now, Saul, this is really the first step on a slippery slope. Saul is about to start really a chain of bad decisions and acts of disobedience. But really, the first time we see him act in a way that uh, brings God's judgment and literally a, a declaration that his, his long-term prospects were, were over. His, his, the idea of him being established in any meaningful way down the road, God said that is not going to happen based on what takes place in chapter 13 that we just read. And this, like I say, it's, on a, it's the first step on a slippery slope. Years ago when I was a kid, I don't know if it was dad or some other preacher, but for a while there, there was a little phrase that I had heard repeated, and it said something along these lines that sin will take you further than you want to go. Do you remember that? It'll take you further than you want to go, It'll keep you longer than you want to stay, and it'll cost you more than you have to pay. And it's the idea that, that really uh, sin and, and the devil, the devil is an enemy that's been at this for years, thousands of years, wrecking people's lives. It, it, sin is, is very easy to get into and very hard to get out of. It's, it's very... Uh, uh, tricky, if you will, when you begin to deal with the devil, the devil will trip you up. Now, the devil's not mentioned by name here, but I believe that we can always see when we see compromise, we see men of God that are taken down, we have a, a, an invisible enemy. Amen? And so what we're seeing tonight is not just Saul versus the Philistines. We're really seeing Saul, God's king, being brought down and defeated by sin. And this is what he did. The crime in tonight's text that brings God's judgment, what was it? What was it that Saul did that brought this condemnation from Samuel? If you want to be real honest, what he did didn't look bad at all. Matter of fact, what Saul did... He had him a little worship service. Saul said, bring hither a burnt offering to me and a peace offering. And he offered the burnt offering. What Saul did was he took upon himself the role of the priest. And he approached the altar of God. There was, listen, before the temple was erected in Jerusalem, there were multiple places where priests and Levites would go, whether it was at Shiloh or at Gilgal like tonight or different places that they would go. But God's standard, whether it was a temple in the future or these tabernacles that they would have, God's standard of holiness when it came to the altar was very high. It wasn't something that was considered to be flippant or casual. You did not approach the office of a priest without qualifications. You, you didn't just volunteer to be the priest for the day. You had to be appointed by God. There were some definite requirements that God had given. Now, in this particular event, it says that Samuel had set up and appointed a time for this offering to be made. It says that in verse 8, there was a set time that Samuel had appointed. And Samuel had said, Saul, in seven days I will come there, I will be there, and we will, I will offer a burnt offering to the Lord. Samuel was the proper one to do that. He stood there in a position, even as a child being dedicated to the Lord, he, he stood in that role of priest or prophet. He was the one that was supposed to offer this. Not only did Samuel set this up, it certainly appears that this was given to Saul as a commandment of the Lord. And this was what he did. He looked around. He didn't see Samuel. And, and by the way, Saul says something that is not true. He said, you didn't come on the day appointed when actually he was standing there talking to Samuel exactly on the appointed day. So 
Samuel showed up exactly when he was supposed to. Samuel was not the one in rebellion. Samuel was not the one in disobedience. It was Saul. What did he do? He offered a burnt offering. This is reminiscent in my mind of the account of Uzziah. If you study the kings of Judah in 2 Chronicles verse chapter 26, the story there is of Uzziah. And Uzziah, you could make a case, was one of the greatest kings that Judah ever had. He began to reign at age 16 and he reigned for 50 two years. I mean, think about it. If you're, if you're an awesome president, you can get eight years, right? He reigned 52 years, King Uzziah. King Uzziah, some of you would know him from the opening lines of Isaiah when Isaiah said in the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord high and lifted up. You may say, well, why are you bring up King Uzziah? King Uzziah had a great reign, but do you know how it ended? It ended in chapter 26 when the Bible says in verse 16 that when King Uzziah was strong, but when he was strong, this is 2 Chronicles 26, 16, his heart was lifted up to his destruction. For he transgressed against the Lord his God and went into the temple of the Lord to burn incense upon the altar of incense. And Azariah the priest went in after him and with him fourscore priests of the Lord that were valiant men. And they withstood Uzziah the king and said unto him, It appertaineth not unto thee, Uzziah, to burn incense unto the Lord, but to the priest, the sons of Aaron that are consecrated to burn incense. Go out of the sanctuary, for thou hast trespassed. Neither shall it be for thine honor from the Lord God. And then Uzziah was wroth and he had a censer in his hand to burn incense and while he was wroth with the priest the leprosy even rose up in his forehead before the priest in the house of the Lord from beside the incense altar and Azariah the chief priest and all the priests looked upon him and behold he was leprous in his forehead and they thrust him out from thence yea himself hasted also to go out because the Lord had smitten him and Uzziah the king was a leper until the day of his death well, why'd you read that? Because in many ways, when you read that, you realize that Saul might have gotten off a little bit easy on this day when he takes, his, he takes this right of a Levite or a priest and he goes and he sacrifices on the altar. When King Uzziah decided to burn incense and the priest withstood him and said, King Uzziah, you're the king. You're not a priest. You're not supposed to be in here. You're not supposed to do this. By the way, a little side note, rabbit trail. Do you know that the separation of powers comes in many ways from a biblical model? But the, the priest, the, the, they said, you don't have the right to do this. King Uzziah got mad at him, and while he was standing there, and it says he had a censer in his hand and he was wroth with him, God smote him with leprosy, like fast-moving leprosy. Like it said, it rose up. I don't know if like his nose fell off, or I mean, I don't know what happened, but he got smoked, and he was happy to leave because he knew he'd been smitten by God. Here's the point. God takes the altar very seriously. Do you know that altar, even going back to the very first altar that Noah erected in many ways was a foreshadow of the cross, the place where one day the Lamb of God would be sacrificed, and it wasn't a light thing. It wasn't something to be done flippantly. And Saul, he sacrificed a burnt offering. That was his crime. Now, in verse 13... As we kind of break down what he did, Samuel characterized this action as this. He said, you have done foolishly. Do you know what a foolish act is? What is the opposite of a foolish act? The opposite of a foolish act, if you're a kid that reads your Proverbs every day, the opposite of foolishness is wisdom. The opposite of a fool is a wise man. And the Bible says that the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. The Bible says the fool has said in his heart there is no God. Do you know a foolish act is any act you do when you uh, sin in a foolish manner? It's as if you're saying, there's no God. God's not, God's not here. I'm acting as though God hasn't spoken. God's not important. And Samuel said, you've acted foolishly. And he said, you have disobeyed the command. He said, you have done foolishly, and he said, you've not obeyed the Lord. Now, if we understand what Saul did, it would also be instructive, I believe, to understand why he did what he did. What did he do? What was his crime? He offered a burnt offering that he had been told not to offer. 
Matter of fact, when he says you violated the command, I think that, that Samuel had said, Saul, in seven days I'll be there and I'll offer the burnt offering. I think Saul knew full well he was not supposed to offer the burnt offering. We, I believe that because he told Samuel, well, I just forced myself. I, I know I shouldn't, but I just forced myself to do it. Had to be done. You weren't here. I mean, you're here now, and yes, this is when you told me you'd be here. I mean, I love the way he got caught. Do you know what it says? It said, as soon as it was done. Do you know, that tells me that Saul's impatience, Saul's impatience, it caused him to compromise 30 minutes too soon. I mean, he, he did it. Samuel's not coming. Let's do this thing. Oh, looky there. Samuel's here. I mean, it was that quick. But why did he do it? Well, first of all, in the text that I read in chapter 13, there was an enemy rising. The Philistines rose against Israel. Now, by the way, they had already been dominated by the Philistines. Even though you see this Nahash, the Ammonite, coming against one town, the fact is, they had been subservient to the Philistines for a long time. The Philistines had had the technological advantage over them. The Philistines had political power over them. Do you know that the Philistines had enacted complete gun control? They got all the guns off the street, and there were no swords, weapons of any kind in Israel. Right? That, you, just, you can read the rest of this. This is what they did. And by the way, I don't believe you should ever trust Philistine government. Amen? I'm telling you. I mean, I, I saw, I was at the Indian clinic one day, and, and I saw a, a, a big Indian kid, and he had a shirt on, and it said, Give the government your guns. They'll take care of you. Ask the Indians. And it showed a picture <laughs> you know, a picture of those guys being led off on the Trail of Tears or something. And, but the Philistines had disarmed Israel. Did you know that? Some of you may not have known the Bible. We talked about stuff like that. But they had disarmed them, said you can't have guns. All you have is hoes and shovels. And by the way, you can't even get a sharp shovel or axe unless you come to us to sharpen it. Now, that's the state that Israel was living in. But beyond that, not only have they been dominated, but now the Philistines rise against them. In, in chapter 13, Saul and Jonathan together were leading, at the time, what appears to me to be a standing army of 3,000 total soldiers. 2,000 with Saul and 1,000 with, with Jonathan. That's what the Bible says. The Philistines showed up with 30,000 chariots. I mean, even if a chariot, it was a, even if it was a little one that only took one horse, but most chariots had a couple of horses. And most of the time, chariots in that day and age, there would be at least two men with each chariot. 30,000 chariots and 6,000 mounted cavalry. To say that Israel was outnumbered would be a gross understatement. Why did did Saul act foolishly and disobey God. Well, if you want to just go and, and lay out some reasons, it seems to me like he was probably motivated by fear. You know, Proverbs 21, verse 3 says, To do justice and judgment is more acceptable to the Lord than sacrifice. But in this moment, Saul felt that he needed to do something religious because the odds were so stacked against him. He was motivated by fear. God has not given us a spirit of fear. Do you know that fear is a terrible motivation? Do you know if we're children of God, the Bible says we've been given a spirit of love and a power and of a sound mind, not a spirit of fear. 2 Timothy 1.7 and I'm not so sure if Saul was more scared of the enemy or if he was scared of what, was, what the enemy was causing. Because if you'll read, as Jonathan already mixes it up and, and fights the Philistines and then Saul blows the trumpet, the Bible says in verse 6 that the men of Israel saw that they were in a strait for the people were distressed. Then the people did hide themselves in caves and in thickets and in rocks and in high places and in pits. I mean, what's going on here? Saul's men that were supposed to fight with him, they're playing hide and seek. 
they're disappearing. I mean, it appears to me that Saul is like, okay, we need our men back in line. Wait a minute, half of them are gone. Where are they? Well, wait a minute. I see one of them in a thicket over there. Somebody's up a tree. Is somebody down in the well? Why is everybody hiding? But guys, listen, when you read this, it's apparent that it's contagious. The children of Israel get scared, and the more that they're scared, and the more that they defect and run and hide, the more people want to defect and run and hide. Do you know that fearful behavior, a lack of faith, discouragement can be contagious? You know, it's worse than COVID. It is. Listen, hopelessness, despair, and discouragement are far worse than a virus. And the people became discouraged. The people were leaving him. See, in my mind, it wasn't just the enemy presence, the fear of the Philistines. It was the loss of leadership. Saul, at this point, had assumed on himself more than he was ever supposed to. And I think this is a common trap with people in leadership positions. Do you know what a leader does not want? A leader does not want everybody defecting. I don't care how great a captain you are of your ship. You don't want mutiny. You don't, you don't want to lose the crowd. You don't want to lose the people you're leading. But the fact is biblical leadership is not contingent on me keeping people happy. Biblical leadership is the man of God following God. Leadership's overrated. Saul should have been focused on following God. But Saul began to see one by one men ditching him. And he began to think, I've got to do something to get the crowd back. I've got to get, I mean, I, I need to get something going on that brings these people together. And Samuel's not here. Now, Samuel, I believe, had said, in seven days, we'll have a service and I'll, I'll sacrifice a burnt offering and peace offerings. God will show up. But Samuel wasn't there the six days leading up to it, and people were defecting day by day, and Saul was getting more and more nervous. You know, when you feel like you're the type of leader that everything rises and falls with you, that you're the only one that can make things happen, you'll be very insecure when things start going south. And this is what happened. And as things started going south, Saul began to see the loss of leadership that the people were trickling away from him. And even though God had already proven that he did not need a multitude, listen, we just came out of the time of the judges. Saul should have been familiar. Listen, if he had loved the word of God and the testimonies of God, he should have already known that a thin down army does not affect the victory in God's agenda. Wasn't going to matter. Listen, 30,000 Philistines are no problem to God. But then, as he begins to be focused on those people leaving, and he tells Samuel this, he says in verse 11, because I saw that the people were scattered from, the, from me. That was where his focus was. I saw the people leaving. Then he does something, and, and this is tragic. He makes the same mistake that Hophni and Phineas made. Do you know when Hophni and Phineas were getting, saw the army getting their tail kicked by the Philistines? You know what they thought? Let's go steal the ark of God out of the tabernacle of God and march down into the army, because that will be our good luck charm that will push us over the edge, and we'll win a victory if we have the ark. Saul seems to assume that the tide would turn if he could get the service started and now. May I just say that this is the beginning of signs that Saul had a superficial spirituality that borderlined on superstition. This is the height of hypocrisy. In chapter 14, we find Saul making a foolish, rash vow as if God needed him to make some type of fasting vow to bring the victory. And here he forces himself, he says, 
to sacrifice an offering to God. May I just say this? God doesn't. If the offering was to God, you know, I like the, the, the principle in the Bible that the Lord loveth a cheerful giver. Do you know, if you're just having to force yourself into some form of service for God, it's probably not being done with, in the right way. It's probably not, it's not being done with the right motive for sure. And here he says the people were scattered, so I had to do this. He develops kind of a superstitious spirituality. Do you know the fact that you show up at church does not mean you're racking up points for, for God? The fact that you do religious stuff or that you say you're a Christian, if the pattern of your life is a pattern of disobedience, God is not going to honor your occasional offering. Now, that's, that's something that's made very clear here. Yeah, but did he, did he give an offering to the Lord? Yeah, and God didn't accept it. You know, the Bible says even the sacrifice of the wicked is an abomination. Especially when it's brought with a wicked mind in this time where Saul fits that bill. Just two chapters later in 1 Samuel 15, when God puts another test to Saul, he's supposed to utterly destroy Amalek. Verse 10 of chapter 15, Then came the word of the Lord unto Samuel, saying, It repented me that I have set up Saul to be king, for he has turned back from following me, and had not performed my commandments, and it grieved Samuel. And he cried unto the Lord all night. When Samuel rose early to meet Saul in the morning, it was told Samuel, saying, Saul came to Carmel, and behold, he set him up a place, and has gone about and passed on and come down to Gilgal. And Samuel came unto Saul. This is First Samuel 15. And Saul said unto him, Blessed be thou of the Lord, I have performed the commandment of the Lord. And Samuel said, What meaneth then this bleeding of the sheep in my ears and the lowing of the oxen, which I hear? Most of you already know this story. They were supposed to utterly destroy everything in Amalek. Saul didn't do that. Saul brought back all the good stuff. He even brought back the king, Agag. And it is in this passage that we get a great principle of the word of God laid out. In verse 19, Samuel asks Saul, Wherefore then didst thou not obey the voice of the Lord, but didst fly upon the spoil, and didst evil in the sight of the Lord? And Saul said unto Samuel, Yea, I have obeyed the voice of the Lord, and have gone the way which the Lord sent me, and have brought Agag, the king of Amalek, and have utterly destroyed the Amalekites. Even in his confession, he's lying. He says, but the people took of the spoil, sheep and oxen, and she, it's the chief of the things which should have been utterly destroyed, to sacrifice unto the Lord thy God in Gilgal. And Samuel said, hath the Lord as great delight in burnt offerings and sacrifices as in obeying the voice of the Lord? Behold, to obey is better than sacrifice, and to hearken than the fat of rams. For rebellion is as the sin of witchcraft, and stubbornness is as iniquity and idolatry, because thou hast rejected the word of the Lord. He hath also rejected thee from being king. Saul then says, I have sinned. But if you read chapter 15, it's, it's just a comedy of errors as Saul makes half-hearted confessions, half-hearted repentance, and he never, and, and something disturbing is you begin to see Saul referencing God as the Lord thy God, not the Lord my God. He deflects, he makes excuses, in contrast, listen, when Nathan confronted David with his sin, David said in a, psalm, in a psalm of contrition to God against thee and thee only have I sinned. David saw himself as living and walking before God. Saul had begun to act in a truly foolish manner, walking in rebellion. It got worse. Isn't it interesting? That in chapter 13, he takes upon himself the office of a priest. And in chapter, oh, chapter 22, he orders the murder of 80 priests. You see, there was a loss of the sanctity of the service of God in Saul's mind. It was something that anybody could do, and as long as you did it, it was like a good omen. You were gonna, you do better in battle if you go ahead and say the prayer at the beginning. And, and I mean, I talked to Dad about this some time back, but do you know I really don't believe 
that I'm going to lobby real hard to put prayer in school. Do you know why? Because the last thing I would want is some heathen atheistic teacher leading some mockery of a prayer. With a, It would do more harm than good. Amen? Now, now listen, I think if a Christian teacher should have the freedom of speech just like an atheist teacher, and I don't believe there's anything wrong with praying in school. Matter of fact, uh, it is not coincidental that the American public school system, if you go back and look at how it started, there's some elements of the school system that I believe are philosophically flawed, okay? That the structure itself. But do you know there was a time when the purpose for educating the American public was so they could read the Word of God. That's, that's right. You can go back and read our history on the thing. And it does seem to be interesting that when God was the foundation of learning, America very quickly excelled and started putting out the brightest and best. We kicked God out. But if I could put it in those terms, I mean, we kick God out. We don't want the Bible. No, -uh, Ten Commandments, get them off the wall. You took the Ten Commandments off the wall, and now you have to have metal detectors and armed cops and their school shootings. Can I say something? There was some tragedy and some bad stuff going on a long time ago, but only a fool would argue that things have gotten better since they kicked God out of school. Amen? But can I just say this? When a culture says we don't give a rip about God and His law, saying a prayer at the beginning of the day is not going to turn everything around. Are you all with me? A prayer. Listen, to say, well, let's say a prayer. Let's put out a religious token out there. Even though we're violating everything God says, God is not impressed by your offering. God is not impressed by your prayer. Saul made the same mistake, listen, that many American political leaders make today. It blows my mind. Listen, I was listening to NPR the other day, and, and they were talking about would they ever get, would we ever get to a place where we had an enlightened scientific president, because did you know that all of the presidents have been Christians? And they were like, yes, men like, and they started listing Christian presidents. And I was just driving down the road, sipping on my coffee, and they were talking about how the Clintons and the Bushes were strong Christians, like as opposed to blatant atheist, I guess. No, they, they were talking about the fact that it's kind of politically challenging for the atheistic minority in our, in our... Can I just say this? We've been led by a lot of godless leaders that were really good at throwing religious people a bone. Amen? And God's not impressed with that. I think Dad covered a lot of that this morning. I don't believe God's the least bit impressed with a pagan leader throwing some kind of Christian offering, some type of prayer or whatever, dropping. It's amazing how godless people can drop bits and pieces of Scripture if they think it'll sell them on some political points. Amen? He was superficial in his religious service. And can I just say this? This is, will be a constant challenge. This will be a constant challenge for you and for me. For all the, It's interesting that in the Sermon on the Mount, in chapter 7, when Jesus starts out and he says, you know, if, if you see that your brother has speck in his eye. He's, by the way, his primary audience is his followers. The pillars of the church, the apostles. And you know what he does? He says, you hypocrites, first remove. Wait a minute, who are you talking to, Jesus? The Pharisees? No. Check it out. Matthew 5. And seeing the multitude, he went up to the mountain. When he was set, his disciples came unto him. And by the way, he's telling his disciples, when you see somebody with a problem and you go to help them, Jesus makes the assumption that even his followers will have to fight the battle against hypocrisy even when trying to help someone else. And you know why? Because we've all gotten dirt in our eyes sometimes. Amen? And by the way, the answer is not everybody leaves sticks in your eyes. No, but it's turn the light of judgment inward first. Before I lead out here, I better make sure that I'm doing things right in here. And listen, it's not easy to humble yourself. 
I want to be, listen, I want to be a loving father that, that is a picture of Christ. And it bothers me. You know, this week one of my children said, you always yell at us, Dad. <laughs> I do not! <laughs> Take that back! <laughs> now, can I tell you something? It's humbling to listen to criticism from inside your home and go, okay. I probably do sometimes, and I don't want to do that. It's hard to, to, to get real. Do you know what it's easier to do? It's easier to throw up your defenses, make excuses, and then put on a religious show to everybody on the outside. That's what Saul got good at. We've got to be very careful because what happened is Saul began to get too big in his own eyes. And as his self-image got better, his spirituality got worse. I will say this. When it, what did he do? He offered something he wasn't commanded to offer. Why did he do it? Well, it could have been from fear. It could have been through the peer pressure of seeing people defecting and leaving him, it obviously had to do with his superficial view of spirituality, but it's very clear that he also was simply unwilling to wait. Do you know patience would have saved the day in this situation? Based on what is laid out for us, just a little bit of patience would have saved the day. Samuel came slow, but he wasn't late. Read the text. He was not late. I think it's wrong to just chronically be late. Samuel wasn't late. He was there when he was supposed to be. He wasn't putting anybody out. He did what he was supposed to do. But when he was not as fast as Saul would have liked him to be. And can I just say this? Do you know that God is often slow? But he's never late. God may be slow in answering a prayer. But he's not late. God is on time. But Saul gave in and forced himself just an hour too soon. He gave up just a little bit too soon. I remember watching a hunting video and the guy had drawn a tag and it was an out-of-state hunt. And he gets up there and this guy, the, the owner says there's a buck that's got 200 inches on his head out there. And you can probably get him. Well, they went out there and they... They didn't see him, but they saw a real nice 160 class buck, and he jumped up, and he shot him. And this was a Christian man, by the way, that was making the hunting video. Justin might remember this story, but he shoots this buck and drops him. And as they're walking to the 160 class buck, which, by the way, is the same kind of buck he could have gotten in Oklahoma, here in this northern state, the 200 class non-typical Boone and Crockett wall hanger stands up 50 yards from the down deer. And the guy's trying to do the hero shot with the deer he shot because he failed to wait for the deer that the guy told him he could get. You know, like the deer's just standing back there like, Hi! You just shot a little too soon if you'd have just waited. You know, that I, I'm convinced that a lot of times the devil will send his idea, his best, right before God sends his best. I believe I can line up examples where I've seen that. Where people had a desire, maybe even a God-given desire, but then there was a compromised way to fulfill it. And instead of just tapping the brakes and letting that go by, they take it. And then God's best comes right along and it's too late. They didn't wait. Man, that would be rough. Saul showed to be a man of the people, not a man of God. Now, I close with this. If we understand what Saul did and why he did it, then what should we learn from that? Like, why does God give us this story? You may say, well, this story just shows how God worked to get uh, the next king, David, in line. But I believe there's more to it than that. Do you know that Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever? God's word is true. And the same God, listen, the same God that, uh, that offered a path of blessing to Saul offers a path of blessing for us. Do you know that if you're saved, you're more than just an average Joe? The Bible says you're a royal priesthood. Do you know you ought to treat the things of God with a level of sanctity? that is deeper than just superficial spirituality.
You ought to hold. The th Listen, the things of God should not be flippant. We, we shouldn't be careless when we're serving God. I know that we're a country church. I know that we're out here uh, on Texana Road in the country. But do you know that the things of the Lord are just as important as the things of band or the things of football or the things of public school prep, pep assembly? Right? Do you know, young people, I believe that serving God, even if that means you volunteering to get up and sing, is more important than a minimum wage job at McDonald's. Because it, it, it seems that that's not the case in many people's minds. Do you know that if you work at McDonald's, they have a dress code? Oh, they do. They expect you to look a certain way if you're their employee. And you may say, yeah, God doesn't care what we look like. I think that's not right. The Bible does say God cares how we present ourselves. Now, I think we can learn from this lesson that if all we're doing is an outward show, God's not impressed at all. But do you know that if things of God really mean something, then it should be important enough for me to make sure I do it, not just what God says, but the way God says to do it. You know, the Bible says things should be done decently and in order. I'm grateful for that. Decently in order. That just tells me that there's some importance to what's going on here. And so we ought to be thoughtful when we undertake God's business. What are some applications to make here? Saul walked away from humility, from holiness... 1 Corinthians 10, 12 says, Let him that thinketh he stand beware lest he fall. Do you know that pride is an enemy that all of us will have to face? It's easy for us to think more highly of ourselves than we ought to. How do you know when that's creeping in? Saul became marked by a spirit of envy. Saul was the king sitting on the throne, wearing the crown. And when David began to get attention, and by the way, the Bible says it was just girls answering themselves in song. Like there were, there were women just making up a tune. Saul happened to hear it, and one of them said, Saul, he's killed thousands. And then some girl goes, and David killed 10,000. And Saul goes, ooh. <laughs> I mean, that sounds silly, doesn't it? Do you know what it was? It was a telltale sign. When the envy bug starts to bite you, it's a telltale sign that you're thinking too much of yourself. That the, the pride bug is getting in there. And listen, when your outward appearance, when your outward acceptance, when your the peers, when what they think becomes more important than obeying God then beware, you're walking down the same slippery slope that got Saul. Something we need to be aware of. And ultimately, we need to, and I know this sounds crazy, if you line David's life up, you know David had probably a worse rap sheet than Saul. Right? Isn't that a blessing? Do you know why David was a man after God's own heart? Because David humbled himself and had a personal walk with God. It appears that Saul went the other direction. By the end of Saul's life, Saul couldn't hear from God even when he tried. Isn't that a tragedy? Do you know today is a day of grace? Today you can still hear from God. Some of you are in a, in a place of decision. And can I just encourage you, don't, don't be stiff-necked. Don't make a decision based on what you want. Make a decision based on what God has clearly said. I don't believe finding God's will is that challenging. I think doing God's will is pretty challenging. I have had people say, well, if I just knew what God wanted me to do. Well, I can tell you a few things that clearly God wants you to do. We should not be unwise, but know what God's will is. Where are you at tonight? Are you, are you in a place where you know God? I don't know whether Saul was a Christian or not. Old Testament, redeemed, righteous type person. He's one of the hard figures in Scripture to to really put under your thumb and say, 
J. Vernon McGee's convinced he's a phony baloney lost man that put on a good show for a while. I don't know. But I do know this. It's not just Old Testament kings that are able to put on a phony show. Amen. You may be here tonight and say, Brother Clay, all I've ever done was acted like a Christian on the outside, but I've never trusted Christ. I've never gotten real with God. It's hard to put on a show for very long. Before long, what you are comes out. I'm going to ask uh, Miss Kristen to come to the piano. Are you saved tonight? If you're saved, then the Bible says you're a royal priesthood. You're a peculiar people. You have a call on your life. Could I just challenge us tonight? Let us learn from Saul's fall. Let's not be guilty. Of committing Christian compromises. Do you know that in chapter 15 when Saul would disobey, he would say, I disobeyed so that I could sacrifice. Samuel said to obey is better than sacrifice. Can I just say this? If you're here tonight and you've sinned, do you know that God is a forgiving God? But young people, do you know what's better than forgiveness? Innocence. It's better to obey, he said, than to sacrifice. If you sin... The sacrifice has been made. Jesus Christ shed his blood on the cross for our sins. And if you'll trust Christ, he'll save you. But if you're saved, listen, don't, don't use the grace of God as a license. Let's, let's not follow the example that we see tonight. I'd like you to stand with me with your heads bowed and your eyes closed. Lindsay Chapel, we like to have a time of invitation. That's not to get you to do something that's not real. It's not to twist your arm but it is to give you an opportunity that if God has spoken to you tonight, that you do something about it. Don't just be a hearer of the word. Maybe in the past few weeks, God has revealed to you that you can make a difference, that you're to be acting and doing something. Then maybe it would help take a knee and make a plan and say, God, I've heard from you, and now I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do something about it. As Miss Kristen plays, if... You need to come. Maybe you need to talk to somebody tonight. Maybe you're here and you'd say, Brother Clay, I'm not saved. You mentioned about being saved. I don't know if I'm saved or not. I've, I've never really discussed it with anybody. The pastor will meet you right here. Are you born again? Have you put your faith and trust in Jesus Christ, His work on the cross? Jesus loves you. Jesus died on the cross for you. And if you need to be saved tonight, He'll save you. Maybe you're saved tonight and you've been struggling with fear. You've been struggling with peer pressure. Can I just encourage you? You plus God is a majority. Don't act in fear and compromise. She's playing a song, Trust and Obey. Are you trusting Christ tonight? She's going to play through that course again. If you need to come, would you come now? Just another moment, if you need to come, you come. Praise the Lord, and uh, it's good to be in the Lord's house tonight. And Clay, thank you for that powerful message. That is food for thought, is it not? And um, as many times as I've read that scripture, it always, it always intrigues me that if Saul had just waited... If he had just waited just a little longer. But that wasn't his heart to do. So uh, we look forward to seeing you on Wednesday evening at six, uh, 7 o'clock, adult Bible study, 6.30 for the kids over in the other building. Um, those of you that are going to be traveling on Tuesday to Oklahoma City to the Abolish Abortion Rally, uh, I believe Brother Jameson is, uh, I don't see him right now, but uh, okay, I see him back there. Uh, he's going to be meeting with you right here. Uh, for just a few moments and give you instruction. 
Uh, and so with that said, after we dismiss, if everyone else would exit the sanctuary as soon as possible, uh, that sure be a blessing. So with that said, if you've been blessed today, say amen. amen. That was stinking weak. So now, if you've been blessed today, say amen. amen. Now that was a little bit better. All righty. Steve Turner, would you make your way up here and uh, dismiss us in prayer, please? Let's pray. Dearly, Father, thank you, Lord, for allowing us to come to church today, Father. This morning's message was wonderful, Father. We just help us to apply it to our lives, Father. Help us to do what we can do uh, throughout this week. And Father, tonight's message, help us to apply that to our lives, Father. I just pray that each and every one of us here tonight, Lord, we just know you in a better way. We ought to pray that we could be more like you. Father, just uh, lead us and guide us as we go out through this week. I pray for all the sick and afflicted, Father, and for the people taking care of them. Uh, Father, I just uh, ask that you would... Uh, that today would be the day of salvation. It's still not over, Father, and it's, uh, we ought to be able to snatch the lost out of the, out of the devil's hand. Lead us, Father. Help us to be better Christians. We'll be very careful to give you the praise. In the name of Jesus, amen. amen.